Alrighty everyone, welcome to another faction overview for the Divided to Power Overhaul mod for Total War Rome 2. That's right everyone, we are checking out the Seleucids in our latest faction overview for the 1.3.3 update for Divided to Imperial. That's right, we're going back and revisiting the Seleucids everyone. So those of you who have been on my channel before, you will know that I have covered the Seleucids a couple years ago now at this point. It's been quite a while. There have been some major reworks for pretty much every faction in the game since then. My last faction overview is still very much relevant in terms of strategy and whatnot. However, what we're going to do this time is actually show off the awesome land units that you will see when you're playing as the Seleucids. Not only that, but the diplomatic and uh, family policies have changed very much since the last faction overview. So we're basically just completely redoing our faction overview for the Seleucids. As I said in all my faction overviews everyone, please comment down below what faction you would like to see me overview next. We are reworking all of the ones that I have done before the 1.3 faction, uh, I mean 1.3 era of Divided Tempera. Also, we still have many factions that just haven't been covered at all, so I am still trying to dive into them. But please go ahead and make sure you comment down below and also vote in our um, poll that I'll be posting which will include the potential options for the next faction overview. Anyway, everyone, that's enough of me talking. Let's go ahead and jump into the Seleucids for the Divided to Power patch for 1.3.3 edition. Let's do it. So the Seleucids are, unsurprisingly, a Diadochoi cultural group. That means that with the following factions, Macedon, Bactria, Epirus, and Egypt, they share the following buffs. Alexander's Legacy, minus 20% resistance to fire and occupation. Then they have the Successor Conflicts plus 10% morale for all units during battles against Hellenic factions. Very, very nice stuff to see. And they're going to be fighting those Hellenic factions and you're going to be ruling a lot of foreign uh, population and cultures. So you need these 100%. Very, very helpful. Royal Estates. Buff is what the Silicates get, which is increased agricultural income. You then have Multiculturalism, which decreases foreign cultural public order penalties. Again, very, very nice. You have this percentage on top of your Alexander's Legacy buff, which is already pretty large. You then though have the Overlords of the East debuff, which gives a major diplomatic penalty with all Persian factions. Persian specifically in culture, everyone. Going to be very interesting. We'll talk about this more once we get into the game. Speaking of which, everyone, this is going to be a long faction of you. Let's not waste any more time. I'll see you all on the Grand Campaign map for the Seleucids. All right, everyone, here we are on the campaign overview for the Seleucids. We are on the campaign map. And as you can see, we can see a whole lot, everyone. This is the largest faction that you start off with in DEI. Pound for pound, city for city, in addition to all of your satrapies and whatnot. You can see, we can see half the bloody map, mate. Pretty insane, if you ask me. Um, so we'll... Count up your city shortly. However, you do have two armies. Commander. First off, in your capital, you have your king who is leading an army in the province, I mean, in the city of Antiochia, which is your capital. You then have another general, which is way over here in Seleucia. So, let's start off with each of your provinces and your cities. First off, we have Syria, the capital of which is Antiochia at this point in time. You then have the city of Tarsos to the northwest. Fapsikos to the southeast and Samosata to the northeast, which is not owned by you. It's owned by the Armenians. It has wine up there as well, by the way. Um, your other cities in this province do not have any of your uh, resources, though. And you can see Hellenic is only at 30%, Persian is at 70 So you're going to take quite some time to go ahead and get um, your Greek culture to be dominant. You do have Syrian Mercenary Archers, nice sort of unit to bring in, very, very helpful. You also have the um, Babylonian Heavy Spearmen and then Cretan Archers, which you can recruit once you get to that point. Just an FYI. So that is your core starting province. Let's go ahead and move further east. You have the city of Edessa, which has silk in it, which is in the province of Mesopotamia. Your capital of Mesopotamia. Tamiya is going to be Seleucia, which actually has a wonder, which is ancient Babylon itself. Very, very nice wonder to have overall. However, it does create Persian cultural influence, which you can't get rid of. 
Um, you can also restore Ancient Babylon. It only has a level 2 here, but this gives you plus 20% wealth from culture in all of your regions. Plus 3 growth in all of your provinces, plus 5 sanitation regions in this uh, province. 800 wealth from entertainment overall, 50% civil research as well, plus 0.5% to your first and second social classes. A nice overall. Not the best wonder in the world, but it's good to have. You then have the city of Charix, which has grain way down here to your southeast. This is your only port settlement that you have that lets you go into the east, way out there. As I said, you have Edessa, and then you have the city of Hatra right here as well. Very minor sort of settlement, almost not worth mentioning, but it is there. Moving to your southwest, we have the province of Palmyra, which is just a two-city province. Palmyra itself right here, and then Jura to the east, which has glassware. Palmyra itself has nothing. So that is all of your cities that, you're, that are directly under your control turn one. So straight off the bat, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cities on turn one directly under your control. However, it doesn't stop there, ladies and gentlemen, because you do have all of these client states out here to the east. Which, I'm not going to go ahead and count up their cities and whatnot, but we will jump into your diplomacy shortly. First, let's talk about your family and your government status. So, you are playing as Antiochus the first. Pretty badass character in history. Your son and heir is Antiochus the second, who is 13. You then have Laodis, Laodice, who is, I guess, your daughter. At least she's listed as that. You also have Seleucus, who is already dead. Stratonius, who is eight years old, another daughter. You then have Apama the second, who is married to the king of Cyrene, whose name is Magus. Very, very interesting. I don't know the specifics of that, so in the comments, so those of you who do know about the Seleucus and Antiochus, go ahead and let us know in the description, I mean, in the comment section, what is the sort of situation with these different characters. We then have Seleucus I, who is dead. He was your father. Anyway, moving on from that. Uh, what sort of government do you have? First off, you start off as a kingdom. You have that plus one XP rank. Military research, tax rate. However, you do have increased upkeep costs. Minus four public order per turn in all your province straight off the bat. That's a little harsh, a little bit much. But if you're playing on normal, it won't be the end of the world, and that plus one XP rank is going to be vital for you, very, very useful indeed. I recommend staying as a kingdom for quite a while. Swapping to an empire is okay, but it's not really going to give you all that many big buffs. Oligarchy is sort of the same. Plus 20% unrest was going to give you that minus four public order anyway. Politia gives you um, a debuff to your foreign cultures, which you don't want. You're going to have plenty of foreign cultures. So I would recommend just staying as a kingdom for as long as you like. Per your own sort of roleplay and immersion. Now, that is essentially it for your starting position. As I said, you have those two armies. You have no navies and no agents on turn one. Now let's jump into your diplomacy though. So, you have one, two, three, four five six different factions that are considered to be your satrapies so this starts over in the west with lydia literally on the western fringes of anatolia um, they have ephesus and Pisinius under their direct command and then they also have iconion very helpful because you then have egypt who is going to be your arch enemy they can get hit from literally any sort of direction even from the coast so rip egypt good luck mate Anyway, um, that's it for Anatolia though. You don't have any other sort of inroads into Anatolia. You don't even have any cities besides Tarsos in there directly under your control. The rest of your client states are going to be over here in the east. So let's go ahead and take a look at them. Now, we have Parthava. They have the city of Raga in addition to almost all of the actual Parthava province. That's their capital there at Hecatompolis. So sure I nailed that pronunciation. Now, notably, you do not have Media, also known as Atropakan, under your direct control, nor Armenia itself, just an FYI, and they're quite close to you on your northern border. Meanwhile, going back down south, though, in this province of Parsa, you have 
the faction known as Parsa uh, itself, which is directly controlling all of these little cities in the province of Parsa. So Parsa owns all of Parsa. Haha, <laughs> I know, shocking, right? Um, three cities, though, which are quite solid and will be good for you to take if you do need to go ahead and take them out. They also have the Wanderer there. I forget the name of that Wanderer, but it's right here. You can literally see it on the campaign map, which is a really cool thing. All of the Wanderers are visible in the campaign. You then have the Asagata, which has the city of Bam, which also has a Wanderer in it, which is the Bam Citadel, which is up here. You can see again on the campaign map. Looking pretty baller, just saying. Uh, and then they also have Hermosia, which is a walled settlement, but it's on the coast, so that would be really nice to take if, again, these people do rebel. Moving further east than that, you then have these Ranka, which has the city of Thrada right here. That's it for them. You then have Haravia. Haravia has two cities. They have Atakawana. Ar 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 I'm sure I know that. They also have the city of Marv directly under their control. And then, as I said, you have Parthava. So that is essentially it. Essentially, you have... Gosh, can I say essentially enough, everyone? Uh, you have almost all of Persia under your direct command. At least central, eastern Persia, pretty much under your command via satrapies, I should say. You then have all of Mesopotamia, literally directly under your command. And then you have all of Syria. You have some amazing provinces straight up under your belt. What other diplomacy do you have going on though? What wars are you fighting? Well, actually none. You don't have any wars on turn one. However, that is going to escalate very, very quickly. First off, Egypt to your south hates you. They can't stand you. They're going to declare war on you quite quickly. You also have these southern uh, Arab tribes down here, the Kidri, uh, Nabataean, the Hagar, the Muscat. In my test campaigns, all of them declare war on you. Why? Because you're getting picked apart. The Armenians hike up here. Bit of a coin flip, but usually I find that they attack the Seleucids. You can try to Welcome, buy them out. Friend. You do have non-aggression with them early on. Our business with good haste, and then but you can see they the are treacherous. And combining that with all of your current... I mean, not current, but soon-to-be issues that you're going to have. Typically, I will see Armenia take on the Seleucids in my own campaign. Personally, myself. You might have experienced something else. Just an FYI, but you do have non-aggression with them, so you can try to buy them out, get that trade flowing, get some other relations to keep them on your side, which I do recommend. Media, though, always, always, always will go ahead and attack the Seleucids, be wary of them, especially in the late game. If you haven't taken them out, as you get towards the mid-late game, their units are going to be really good once they hit their own reforms, so be careful of that. Um, as for any other diplomacy though, you don't have anything. Even Macedon, you have nothing. Um, uh, Egypt itself, you have no relations at all. Uh, the only trade you have coming in is with the Morians way out here in the Far East. Just trade, no non-aggression. Parsa, which is your client state, obviously. Lydia. And then Cyrenaica. Cyrenaica you only have trade such... with, even though the king is actually married to one of your daughters. At least in the family tree it's listed as a daughter. Um, but yeah, just an FYI. Rhodes and all of these Greek city-state style factions are not under your thumb yet. But you do have influence. You do have the potential for it. But that is essentially it when it comes to your diplomacy. Um, not too many friends and even all of your client states don't necessarily like you. So you can see you're going to get pulled into wars in multiple different directions. Oh, sorry. There is one faction I forgot to mention. Cappadocia right here. Um, you do have trade with them and non-aggression, but you don't have any alliance and not a client state either, or a satrapy, I should say. And it's just a one sort of city, so not really a big deal. I often do see the Galatians actually wiping them out. Despite the Galatians being really difficult, they actually seem to be doing better in the latest, latest EI patch. So for those of you who have fought campaigns since the new update, I'd be curious to see what you say. And think about Galicia being more powerful now. But I see the AI doing better as them anyway. Now, that is it for your diplomacy, everyone. I know, big mouthful already. We're not even halfway through. So let's keep cruising on. Uh, first off, let's dive into your economy and then your population. So you can see on turn one, our economy is starting off fantastic. We have 7,800 income turn one, literally. 
pretty solid overall. Now, you do need to make some pretty major choices on turn one. First off, you have two armies. Which army do you want to recruit men to? Do you need to recruit men to both? Which direction do you want to spend once you do recruit them? What are you going to do, essentially? Um, not only that, but all of your provinces and cities start off with level one low tier stuff. They need to be upgraded. So how are you going to do that? Right? So many ifs and buts and coconuts to talk about here. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly what you should do with your economy. Why? Because there's no necessarily right or wrong option. However, something to keep in mind. Egypt is a major threat to you. I would direct your military forces there as soon as possible. Especially if you could take the province of Egypt itself. The probably, arguably, the most richest province in the game. If you take it, you're going to win the entire campaign, there's no doubt. In the meantime, though, if you want to sort of play tall a little bit and try to fan for a while, Seleucia can be very nice for you as a bit of a economic powerhouse. And I really like it because you could do a few different things. You could do an agricultural sort of spam, similar to Egypt and Africa. However, your wonder isn't really tailored to that. It's tailored towards culture. So you might, might want to focus on buildings that will increase your culture. Once you upgrade your um, restored ancient Babylon wonder, you then even get plus 20% wealth from culture. So really focusing on just building cultural buildings everywhere in all of Mesopotamia could be useful. Or you could do industry or you could do commerce. Really, you can do quite literally anything in this province. But I do recommend that you try to tailor your province to cater to whatever sort of economy you need there. So build those temples that give you bonuses. If you're going to do that culturals thing, make sure you're building culturals, uh, buildings in as many cities as you can. Again, I'm not going to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. I'm not amazing with economies, economies myself. But to be honest, as long as you're building things up and you're not building it to the point where you have massive debuffs, you're going to be fine. No big deal. Relax. You're okay. You're the Seleucid Empire, ladies and gentlemen. You're not just the Seleucids themselves. Anyway, economy-wise, though, you're looking very good in terms of, like, self-reliance. You then also have insane amounts of trade potential. You have quite a few resources under your own direct belt. You're trading with the Morians, which gives you a bunch of awesome resources, too. And then you can get trade with a lot of these Western factions. All of the Greek city-states will get trade with you because you have stuff that they just simply don't. You might want to trade with the Romans, Carthage, whoever. Send out like a single admiral. Go ahead and get trades throughout the entire Mediterranean. People will want to trade with you because you're big and you have some sexy, cheeky resources that everyone wants. Everyone wants silk. Everyone wants glassware. Everyone wants grain. All of these sorts of awesome things coming in, including spice. You might even want to come on down into Arabia so you can get these slaves, which are way down here. There's also going to be... What is it there? Oh crap, I forget what the sub I have off the top of my head. I only did a faction of you on them right now. Spice, they have spice there. And then up here in the northeast there's silver and lead. So Arabia itself has some good resources. Just saying, just throwing it out there. Economy-wise, you're pretty much set. Fantastic, nothing too much to stress out about, everyone. Um, moving on to population then. I mean... <laughs> What, what do you think? <laughs> um, starting off the bat, all of your cities are well into the twenty, like mid-20s to 30,000s. Um, not only that, even though you don't have the Hellenic culture being dominant here, we can still see that you have a very nice balance of population. So that's not going to hold you back too massively, although it is decreasing your population in the meantime. In certain regions. Um... Seleucia is also decreasing as well. So you will want to try and convert that culture as soon as you can. However, in the short term, you have some fantastic um, population pools to draw from. Just make sure you're drawing it from multiple cities. Don't just sit here in Antiochia and recruit multiple 20 stack armies. You're going to drain the population out of Antiochia. That's something that we can talk about in another video entirely when it comes to population management, but just saying, spread out the love, okay? Don't just have all of your men sit in one place. Now, not only that, but as you expand west, take out these Greek cities. 
maybe go back into your homeland and take over Greece, you will get Greek-speaking people under your belt. That means that you'll be able to recruit core units from those provinces instantly as soon as you take over those cities. Even as you march into Egypt, while they don't have the biggest amount of Hellenic culture, some of their regions do. And so they will be able to provide you with population boosts. But just currently as it stands, your early to mid game population is looking good. Your sort of late game might be tricky depending where you go. If you go to North Africa, of course you're not going to have Hellenic people, right? If you go to like the Far East, you're not really going to have too much Hellenic stuff going on. Just an FYI. So then that brings us to a sort of a little bit of a wrap up on the campaign. What are some major tips to keep in mind? Who is, who's going to be your arch nemesis? Things along those sorts of lines. So, as I said, a lot of people hate you. In fact, almost everyone does. But there's some really big ones to worry about. Egypt. Your units are better than theirs, but they have more money than you. And they are also in a far more defendable position. They have Jerusalem, Tyros, and then the Sinai Desert down here, Alexandria. They have so many defensive choke points to cut you off. Not only that, but you have the Arabs coming in from the south who can really harass your lines if you don't balance it out with them. I would try to get them to be your friend if possible. You're then going to have media coming in from the east and then Armenia coming in from the north again if you mismanage relations. Armenia, you should really make an effort to be your friend quite early on. Media... I don't think there's much you can do. They're pretty much just going to attack you whenever it is fit for them. Just some FYIs to keep in mind. But once you do take out these sort of early to mid game enemies, you're set. You can take on the Romans, no problem. Your pikemen will slaughter their legionaries. Legionaries, whatever. Carthage itself, they don't even get pikes. They're a non issue for you. You'll wipe out Carthage. There's no other juggernaut faction in the game that can rival the Seleucids. It just simply isn't. I don't care who or what you are. They will wipe out everyone. Their military is so amazing. Position is fantastic. They just need to survive. And then you will do amazing with them. However, something that must be spoken about is the infamous Rebellion script. Now, those of you who have played the Seleucids in the past, you will remember that once you get to a certain turn, or at least every turn up to a certain point, you do have a chance of a Satrapy Rebellion occurring. Historically around this time, Satrapies rebelling against the Seleucids was not an uncommon occurrence. So there is a event that can trigger randomly, which forces, well, doesn't force, but it sort of announces, I should say, some of your satrapies to rebel. First off, it is not a forced script in that you're not going to have every single faction under your direct control rebel on you. At least not, it's not guaranteed. The event will trigger at some point, Almost certainly. However, what factions actually rebel actually does come down to not just entirely RNG, but what effort you put in. Essentially, what you need to do is on the diplomacy screen, if there is a satrapy you don't want to have rebel, you need to look at them, you need to look at your relations with them, and you need to get it back to be above, I believe the number is 150. If you can get it to be 150 into the green, they will not rebel. Now you can see you do not have many factions that will not rebel. So yeah, take that with that what you will. There is a decent chance that Pafava, Saranka, Asagarata, Parsa as well will rebel. Decent, solid chance. Lydia, they actually really like you. They're Hellenic, they're Satrapy, they can hang out. Um, but yeah, your Eastern client states, Satrapies, whatever you want to call them. Do you have a decent, solid chance of rebelling? However, it sort of depends on what you do. If you start giving them money, if you get trade with them, if you start attacking their enemies, they will start to like you very, very quickly. So there is that chance, which again is going to fall down to you on, can I stop these satrapies from completely leaving me? In my personal opinion, it might even just be better to let them rebel. And then go ahead and wipe them out yourself. But you also are going to struggle if you're dealing with um, invasions from Egypt or from media, etc. So you're going to be pretty quick in this campaign. Which is something else we'll talk about later on. But just an FYI, you can try to hold back that... I, I don't like to call it script, but it is an event script that does fire. 
there is an event that lets you know, hey, such and such rebellions have happened. Just an FYI, everyone. Just keep in mind, everyone, that this chance of your factions or your clients, satrapies, whatever you want to call them, rebelling, can occur pretty much any turn. Typically, it will happen within the first 20 to 25 turns, but it might not happen until turn 30 or 35, somewhere around those lines. It also might ha uh, happen for you turn 2, turn 3, turn 4, I don't know. But that's typically what is going to be expected between the first 10 to 20 turns is when this event will occur where you'll have those client satrapies start to rebel. So if you do want to keep them, you do need to make sure you begin changing those relationships as soon as possible. Okay, so before we move on to the military, let's just talk briefly about your reforms, everyone. As you can see here under the technology tree, you have the Thurios reform requirements, which occurs for you at turn 50 once you achieve Imperium level 3. And then you have the Thorax reforms, which happens at turn 120 once you get to Imperium level 5. So you do need to put in a bit of effort, but turn 50 is going to come around just like that. Um, and then your Imperium that you start off with you already started at level 4, so you're going to get that initial reform without any issue whatsoever. Anyway everyone, let's go ahead and jump into the military section of this faction over here for the Seleucids. Alrighty everyone, here we are, the military section of our Seleucid faction overview. And it's time to show off one of the best looking as well as the best practical rosters in the entire Divide its Imperium mod. Oh, wait, did he just say it the right way? Just kidding. Divide its Imperium, everyone. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of units to go through here. I'm going to try my best to cover them all. However, this is a lot. So first off, I'm just throwing my voice. Second off, some of these units, I'm just sort of going to gloss over relatively fast and spend a little bit more time on the more relevant units, okay? Just an FYI. Anyway. A game of cavalry! Let's start off with your general. You have a lot of different general units you might use. So what I did was I got the most sort of late tier elite unit you will probably get for your general. Which is the late Royal Guard Cavalry. Very, very solid shock cavalry unit. Um, one of the better like shock cav units in the entire mod. But it's not going to be top 10 I don't believe. Uh, top 20 for sure. Top 10 I don't think so. But not far away from it. Fantastic unit to have though. Despite it being super heavy, melee defense is only 8. So again, if you get stuck in an armor-piercing grind, they will lose. Ready to ride. However, you then have the Companion Cavalry. This is one of the first generals you will actually ever have. Very much Alexander-esque sort of uh, cavalry unit here. I'm sure that was intentional. Very much a mid-tier sort of shock cav unit though. Very much dedicated only to shock. So don't let it get stuck in a long grind out fight. Looking amazing as all of these units are. Now, let's start off by going through your melee units. As in your swordsmen, because you don't have that many, surprisingly. And then we'll get to your skirmishes. I know, I'm doing things a little bit out of order, everyone. Oh my gosh, the world is on fire. Ready for orders. You have Greek infantry, almost not worth mentioning, except they're 300 men per unit, and they do have three javelins to throw. Militia tier, crappy unit. At your service. You then have Thurio Swords. Not a bad unit to have, but it only has 8 armor, which is disgustingly, disturbingly very, very low. Super low, in fact. I feel like the Thurio Swords used to be greater for the Seleucids, but perhaps not. Um, either way, the melee attack is okay at 9, defense at 14, but their armor is almost non-existent. Get them some armor's armor as soon as you can. Ready. 300 men per unit, though, and 3 javelins, so worth mentioning. Um, Silver Shield Swordsman, this is where we get a little bit more elite, a little bit more professional, a little bit more proper. Melee attack of 16, defense of 12, total weapon damage of 29, armor of 38, base brown 52, and they do have a single javelin to throw in. In addition, they can do a defensive test tutorial and defensive formation. As I said, quite professional now. Super useful unit. Not the most flexible unit in the world. They are very heavy in very heavy in terms of armor, so they're gonna be quite slow. But you get them in a grind out fight, they will grind through the enemy like it's nothing. After that, Royal Peltasts. We then have the Royal Peltas unit, one of the most infamous units of the Seleucids. Melee attack of 16. 
basically the same as a Rom Fire Warrior for, unit from Odrysia. So essentially a shock unit. Defensive 8, which is decent. Total weapon damage is only 29 though. Charge bonus of 18. So that's why this isn't really technically a shock infantry unit, but it could very well be. It's very close to it. Armor is at 30. They do have 3 javelins to throw in, which is good. Because you have 200 men uh, per unit as well. Very nice elite swords. Pretty crap low swords is the summary for that. Let's go to your skirmishers. Missile infantry ready. Greek javelinman, terrible unit. Try not to use it if you can avoid it. Peltasts. You then have the Ifri Cratian early peltas. I'm sure I know that pronunciation. For this one, these are actually very useful as a javelin unit for you. However, they only have five ammunition. Not insane. But then they are also actually very useful because they're a spear unit as well. Um, and they're almost like a bit of an aggressive spear unit. They have a melee attack of 8, defense of 16, total weapon damage of 28, and 15 armor. These guys are super useful at supporting your flanks. Have them support your cavalry in taking out the enemy cav. They will do wonders for you. They're just super useful overall. Very, very nice unit to have. Ready for orders! You then have just a dedicated Peltus unit, as is the core of the Diadochi factions. Um, very, very nice. 25 armor, melee attack of 9, defense of 14. Total weapon damage of 26, though. So, not the most deadly, but very well equipped and very professional, for sure. Discipline ability is there. Slingers! One single slinger unit, 190 range, which is nice for a pretty terrible slinger unit. Missile infantry ready! One single arch unit, your Greek archers. Admittedly, you do have Cretan archers available in your core province, but I just wanted to remove them and other mercenary units from this section of the overview, just so as not to taint it. I only want to show you core units in the roster, but you do have many other units at AOR Mercenary that you can recruit for online play, as well as just that are available in the campaign. Well, that's it for your skirmishes. Obviously, you're tailored towards doing short-range pelters skirmishing, um, and your other long-range units are pretty lackluster, so you're going to need those Cretan archers, those Syrian heavy archers as well. However, let's move on to the true core of your army which is spearmen and pikes so let's start off just with your typical spears at your service first off you only have one actual true spear unit that isn't hoplite ish this is just your furio spear unit amazing unit to have in online play as well as in your campaign make sure you're utilizing them um although i believe they've been slightly buff uh debuff sorry with only one javelin i swear they used to have three um, the swordsmen do, but yeah, the spearmen, I thought they had more. Either way, it's probably good, because they're a little bit too powerful. They always have been. So, fantastic unit. Use as a flank unit, or even as a main line for a while if you need it. Militia! You then have a levy hoplite unit, which is, dare I say, a levy hoplite. Not bad, considering it is a levy, so you can absolutely use this to defend a city or a town. Hoplites! You then upgrade to your sort of solid Seleucid Hoplites. Unfortunately, these guys are all but entirely irrelevant due to you having pikes now. But you do have good mid-tier Seleucid Hoplites if you want to go down the Hoplite route. Again, I don't know why you bother. I know there's going to be someone that comes, but I'm not a holic. They're better at defense. They're better at skirmishing. I know. I know there is technical benefits to using Hoplites instead of pikes, but in reality, which one is going to win you more decisive engagements? You throw a hoplite up against a pike and then you get back to me, let me know. Why you come on? After this, we then do have more spearmen, which are not hoplites, but kind of are not really. I don't know what you would classify them as. I guess just very heavy spearmen, as is the description here. However, they do have hollow square and they do have defensive formation abilities. But no phalanx to form, so I guess technically spear you know. Stats across the board are disgustingly good. Melee attack of 9, which is good for a very heavy spear unit. 22 melee defense, though. That's insane. Going along, going along sorry, with an armor of 41. These guys are elite spears for you. I believe you can recruit them as a general as well, but just an FYI, they're fantastic. Commander. You then have the shield bearers hoplite unit here. 
If you're going to recruit Hoplites, recruit these bad boys. They are insane. Very, very nice unit to use. Essentially like a Silver Shield Hoplite is the vibes I'm getting here. Um, they do have Phalanx ability, no other ability, so. So just be aware of that. But really attack a 9 defensive 19 armor 41. That is a Hoplite right there. They will give the Spartans a run for their money, dare I say. However, what really will give the Spartans a run for their money is By your, your Pike Contingents. Bronze Shield Pikes! You have the Greek Bronze Shield Pikes, as he was just saying there. Fantastic unit, and again, you can tell the difference between a Hoplite and a Pike based on the actual spear itself. Here is the tra traditional, although relatively modern for the time period, I guess you could say, Sarissa Lance. If you see the Sarissa, that means it's a pike unit, everyone. Fantastic unit. I'm just looking at the length, size, does matter, absolutely. And the Macedonians know it. So they're going to hit you with their big, long pikes. Moving on, though. Pikes! We have your Thorax Bronze Shield Pikes. Pretty much an upgrade in every sense of the word compared to your last unit. Both of them have pike failings, by the way. Um, yeah, just why wouldn't you use them? Get them as soon as you can, really. 256 men per unit, as is your Greek Bronze Shield Pike, by the way. Silver Shield Pikeman. However, a unit you also will never want to turn down is a Silver Shield Pike unit. Incredible unit. Um, it's even uh, better than the Greek Bronze Shield Pike unit. The Thorax variant has better armor, technically, but its morale is way lower. And uh, the Silver Shield is faster in terms of speed. So, just an FYI for you. However, the Silver Shield Pikes also have Pike infantry. At your command. the 4x version of the Silver Shield Pike. Again, just insanely looking, look incredible. Um, but stat, pound for pound, they're also insane. Just an unbreakable wall against anything that you throw in front of them. They will destroy Praetorians in a head-on collision. They will destroy Spartan Bodyguard Hoplites. Although Spartan Bodyguard Hoplites will give them a good run for their money, but they're still going to get defeated. Can't beat the Sarissa in a head-on collision. You just can't. Don't do it if you're fighting the Silicids. If you are the Silicids, force everyone to fight you head-on. But that's it. You only have four actual core pikes to choose from, everyone. Just an FYI. Let's move on to your cavalry really quick. You only have two skirmisher cav. Yours to command. Greek javelin cavalry unit. 120 men. Quarantine cavalry. You then have Thurios cavalry right here. You are quite substantially better and significantly better, um, pretty much across the board. Only issue is that they're lacking speed, but they do have 120 men as well. Ammunition is at six javelins, as is your lower tier Greek javelin unit, you know, though. So these guys can do skirmishing, scouting, and they can do okay in sort of low level melee engagements. That's essentially it for your, sh for your skirmisher cav, although we do have one sort of exception. The brave, ready for orders! which is going to be your Light Furious Cavalry. They have a couple Javelins to throw. And then your Tarantines, which we're going to get to shortly wherever they are. I forget. We'll find them shortly. Light Furious Cavalry, though, very, very fast. Again, 120 men. Not all of your units are 120, so that's why I'm putting that out now, FYI. But very solid, low-level mid... Uh, not mid, sorry. Low-level melee, that's what I meant to say, Cavalry unit. Good, nice and cheap. Light cavalry! You then have a light cavalry unit which has no javelin at all, but this time their armor is substantially higher at 28. Melee attack of 11, defense of 8. Charge bonus of 54. These guys are not to be trifled with, despite them being claimed as light cav, far more mid sort of cavalry based. Just saying. However, we then jump up to the Tarantines, which technically, pound for pound, they actually are worse in stats. However, they are Tarantines, so their speed is extremely high at a high 8, and then they have 4 javelins to throw at the enemy as well. Also, their formation is a little bit more rough, as you can see, which helps them, because it means that they can try to avoid enemy fire if they're a little bit more spread out. Not only that, but they have 120 men in their unit as well. Just an FYI, but you have Tarantines. Heavy cavalry, ready and willing. Awesome little unit. Here you have these Seleucid... Politokioi Cavalry. Politokioi Cavalry, sorry. Um, basically, you're rich men coming in on cavalry, on horseback. Not a bad melee cav unit, but I would much more prefer to spend your hard-earned money on higher tier units. 
But yeah, not bad. But this is your first unit that we're seeing that only has 100 men in it. Swift riders at your um, whereas your next unit, your Seleucid Citizen Cavalry, is the same. They only have 100 men per unit. This is very much a solid mid-level, mid to higher level, really, melee cavalry unit for your armies. Good sort of unit to recruit. However, it's, you know, again, you might prefer to just do, like, shock cavalry. It's just a pretty heavy investment in a unit like this. Solid overall. Absolutely. But you might get more cost-efficient cavalry over here in the, in the rear. You can see I'm sort of... Glancing over these, and that's because we're now really getting to the cream and butter, which is, is cavalry. your shock cavalry. So first off, you have some Thessalian Thorax cavalry. Insane cav to have. Fantastic. But it is purely shock cav, so do not let them get stuck in a melee grind out fight, okay? They will die. They absolutely will die. Only four defense is despicable. Do not let them get stuck in a melee grind out fight. Warriors of Makoda. After that, we now have the Hellenic Cataphracts. That's right. The Greeks have adopted the Cataphract style of warfare. This is your Hellenic Cataphract. Nowhere near as good as a Parthian Cataphract. Let me rephrase that. Not as good as a Parthian Cataphract. It is near as good, but it's not quite as good. Um, we're seeing the pattern of only 100 men so far per your Cataphract shock cavalry units, just an FYI. But yeah, 51 armor, total weapon damage of 30, pretty solid of all, melee defense of 8, attack of 12. So they can do okay in a melee engagement long term, but Companion they're definitely not a melee cav dedicated unit, just FYI. You then have the Greek Companions um, cavalry unit, which is basically the same as what I showed you earlier for that general. Um, but very, very solid, again. Um, stat for stat, pound for pound. There's going to be some stats that are worse and some that are better. So the Hellenic Cataphracts have more defense and more armor. Greek Companions, though, they're more aggressive 15 attack. But their charge bonus is only at 60. Um, weapon damage goes up to 33, though. So, again, some sort of ifs and buts, coconuts. Depends on your own sort of wants and needs between the cavalry here. No clear, like, one unit that's better, in my opinion. A game of cavalry! Then we have your early Royal Guard Cavalry. Again, another general that we were essentially looking at earlier. Nothing too special about them. They do look fantastic, as does this entire roster so far, everyone. But, again, not looking to waste too much insane time. Just loving the look of the Saluka units. They do have amazing looks, but... As I said, this is just to overview them. However, we're not done yet, everyone, because we have three special unique units for the Seleucids. That's right. Chariots. Let's go ahead and check them out. Chariots. That's right. You have Scythe Chariots as well, no less. There is the Scythe on them. You do have the Chariot themselves. 25 Chariots per unit here. This is a Chariot I actually would recommend you try out at the very least. Now, is this as good as the elephants that you obviously can recruit? No, no, it's not. Straight off the bat, no. I don't care who, what you ask. Chariots will not beat elephants, in my opinion. However, scythe chariots, if you're going to recruit any chariot at all ever, this is the chariot to recruit. Its armor is quite high at 53, has four horses pulling it, um, even has some skirmishing capability. I believe they're throwing javelins as they're running around. And. They have scythes, so they're going to actually kill the enemy when they bump into them. Uh, weapon damage of 61 in total. Stats you can't look into too much, but with the scythe chariot, it gives you a nice good idea of what to expect. These guys are heavy. Don't let them get stuck, though. They will die again relatively quickly, especially things like javelin fire or focused archer fire. They will suffer quite quickly. However, we then have your elephants, and these are core roster elephants, everyone, as are the chariots. These are not AOR or mercenary. So first off, I'm going to go to the right. War elephants! You have Indian elephants. Now, these guys are okay. However, they don't have any skirmishing capability. So this is sort of like your lowest sort of elephant you're going to get access to. On top of that, though... War! You then have these Syrian war elephants recruitable from your barracks as well. These guys, I would prefer to recommend. First off, they look insane. 
They just look so amazing. I've had some awesome screenshots with these bad boys. Not only that, but they have armor. Their faces are not covered in just beautiful gold, but it's also defensive gold. So their armor is at 12 compared to the Indian elephants, which just has an armor at 4. Basically no armor at all for them. So your Syrians are going to do more damage, they're going to last longer, and they also have skirmishing capabilities with a range of 180. These guys are going to be shooting their arrows very far, but that's okay. They're just an incredible unit to have. Absolutely will wing you entire campaigns on their own. With just a single Syrian elephant unit in your roster. So everyone, let's just quickly touch on your navy. Your navy is actually pretty fantastic. You have quite a lot of different units. A lot of different marine variants as well. And you have some very heavy ships. Your, uh, your admiral goes all the way up to 2000 HP. Then there's a 1600 and I believe a 1200 as well. Fantastic ships to have. You may as well go ahead and get the 2000 HP one as soon as possible. It's fantastic. Why wouldn't you use it? Um, especially for taking on those navy heavy factions like Rhodes. Um, potentially um, Athens as well. Depending on who you fight. Crete. Egypt. You're going to need an awesome navy to take them on. And you do have one available at your fingertips. You just need to utilize it. So I recommend using marine style warfare. Or you can try and do the ramming style as well, but you're just going to need big heavy ships. So go ahead and spam yourself some and you'll be able to win the, the Mediterranean Seas, no problem. Just an FYI, I could spend some time looking at your naval roster, but to be honest, all the ships are just pretty similar, it's just bigger. Bigger or smaller. Your units are fantastic, but they don't change too much from ship to ship. So that's why we're just talking about it briefly. All right, everyone, time for the verdict of the Seleucid faction. Overview, everyone, few points to talk about before we get to the difficulty. First off, your domain. You have, I believe, literally the biggest uh, starting position of any faction in the campaign. You have a lot of cities under your belt, a lot of provinces as well, not just cities. And then you have all of your different um, client satrapies. Fantastic. Very, very nice overall. Um, however, you do need to be aware that you can get picked apart from different angles. So I did talk about that earlier, but just to reiterate some really key things. Be careful of your northern borders, Armenia, and um, what do you call it? Media itself. Media will definitely declare war. Armenia will if you don't nurture your relationship with them well enough. Especially on those higher campaign difficulties, they will probably betray you. To your south, you have the Egyptians, and then you also have the Arab uh, nomadic cultures that will be coming in, cause you some trouble. Be careful of them, because they can come out of the desert from anywhere without taking any attrition. You have to go on a very windy, long road to get to their cities, and even then, it's going to be a pain in the butt for you to march that far without losing too many men. In addition to dealing with Egypt. So, um, you can easily get pulled apart in different directions, is why I'm talking about how big your domain is. Something to be aware of. You might need to prioritize certain wars over others. You might need to sacrifice a little bit of land in order to actually hold on to your core provinces as well. In my opinion, the Seleucids have the best roster in the campaign, almost. They have one of the best rosters in the campaign. Um, they can annihilate any faction that's around them, including the Egyptians. Their roster is better, quality-wise, pound for pound. You also have amazing mercenary AOR units all around you. Essentially, you have literally every tool under your belt to do insanely well. Your pikemen will annihilate the Romans. So late game fighting against Rome is going to be easy for you. It shouldn't be a problem. As long as you fight those battles manually, don't waste your time order resolving. You're going to lose a lot of men. Go ahead, spam those pikes against the Romans. Good luck to them. They're going to suffer and die. That's it. Um, your elephants will mop up their flanks. Your cavalry is insane. They will annihilate the Roman cav. Rome is going to struggle. The Egyptians are also going to struggle, although they will give you a slight run for your money because, again, they have the money and they do have pikes. It's just their pikes aren't as good as yours once you get those silver shields and whatnot flowing in as well. Um, furthermore, no other factions around you even come close to your quality. Media late game has some nice quality units, but that's like turn 200 and something by then. They're gone. You've already wiped them out. Armenia does have a decent roster, but again, just not as good as yours. 
Bactria has a roster almost as good as yours, but they're at the edge of the map. Probably going to like you anyway. Uh, Macedon has a great... Uh, what do you call it? Roster. But the starting position is terrible. Really, really tough. They're going to take a long time to even fight you. Even once they do end up fighting, if they do, which is unlikely, um, you're still going to be able to just wipe the floor with them so easily. You'll have way more money territory armies than the Macedonians. Basically, militarily speaking, you should be winning almost every single battle you get involved in. There is going to be obviously chances and opportunities where you either make a mistake or the enemy catches you off guard, etc. Catches you in a bad spot. But pound for pound, you have one of the best militaries in the world at this time. So I really just want to iterate, fight those battles manually, you will have that quality of your troops really shine and come through for you in a way that you might not expect. Especially with those sort of weapons of mass destruction, you have those chariots and those two different types of elephants, they will rock the enemy to their foundations, they literally will. But anyway everyone, I have talked about pretty much every other point that I want to talk about throughout this entire overview. So, without any further ado, that takes us to the difficulty rating. So, my last faction overview for the Seleucids, I gave him a 5 out of 10. Overall, not a tough campaign, but not an easy one either. Now, the Seleucid roster has been updated visually. There have been some new units, have been some changes. There has also been some pretty significant changes on the campaign map. Diplomacy-wise, as well as in terms of how you recruit certain units, how certain features function and whatnot, since my last overview, right? So, has my difficulty rating actually changed? Well, ladies and gentlemen, my difficulty rating for the Seleucid Kingdom, Seleucid Empire, Seleucids, whatever you want to call them, is still a 5 out of 10. <laughs> um, it's a 5 out of 10. This is a average or normal campaign difficulty, in my opinion. Now, you do have a lot of difficult things to deal with in the campaign. You have so many different enemies pulling you in different directions. Uh, Land-wise, you will have some naval stuff to deal with as well, which is going to be pain in the butt. Because of all of this, your economy is going to tank slightly once you build those elite, sort of, um, really Hellenic-based armies, which are going to be expensive. But, pound for pound, again, your units are amazing. Recruit those elite units. You will do wonders of work with them, use those super um, special units like elephants. They will win you battles like it's nothing, especially against the AI everyone. So in my opinion, your amazing military more than makes up for your campaign difficulties that you'll have to go through. Sure, the rebellions that will come through are going to be a big pain in the butt, of course. But again, your roster will annihilate all of them. Not only that, but they're pretty far from your core territory. Um, they obviously will send armies to attack you and be a pain, but you will be able to have some time to prepare. Anyway, everybody, that's just my opinion, though. 5 out of 10 campaign difficulty. I'd really love to hear what you all think. Do you think it's a bit harder? Do you think it's a bit easier, perhaps? Maybe it just depends on your own experience and skill level, which, to be honest, which is a lot of what of these uh, difficult ratings depend on. But anyway, everybody, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I shall see you in the next one.